WROC TV8, Rochester. Good evening, I'm Mark Rim. Virginia Butler is off tonight. At the head of our late report, still more waves being made over pure waters. The county project has been besieged by accidents and criticism for its minority contracting. News 8 has learned tonight an association of minority contractors claims the county has been consistently late paying them for work on the sewer system. That public announcement is expected tomorrow. News 8 also learned the Morin administration is considering suspensions and dismissals in the engineering department. And the county has decertified two minority subcontractors for having close ties with white-owned companies. And it wouldn't surprise me in the least that the administration finds uh, people who are that culpable that they take action. The Sewer Investigation Committee met tonight in hopes to start questioning witnesses at its next meeting. Chairman Bill Benet says he'll use subpoena powers if necessary. Sounds of protest are still being heard tonight regarding the sirens incident near the Ganae nuclear plant Saturday night. Webster residents who heard the warnings, which turned out to be a mistake, say they couldn't find out what was happening. A county legislator from Webster, Peter Stacy, and County Public Safety Commissioner Ray Sanarocco discussed the issue here on News 8 at 6. Many citizens who followed those instructions as promulgated by the county and by the Rochester Gas and Electric Company called in and listened to the radio as instructed and found out that they could not get information as to whether it was a real incident at the Ganae plant. This makes us all concerned that if there were to be a real incident at the Ganae plant, what would really happen? The information we had on Saturday night was that it was a single isolated siren uh, and uh, uh, under the circumstances, a, uh, an activation of emergency broadcast didn't seem to be warranted. What the Emergency Prepared Office, which Santa Rocco oversees, learned today eight sirens sounded Saturday instead of one. Santa Rocco says they're unsure exactly what caused them to go off. The Grandy family in Hamlin received another setback tonight. The town board turned down their permit to build on their home, giving them two weeks to come up with a suitable plan for their sewer system. Earlier today, Diana Whiteman returned to Hamlin to speak with some of the principals in this ongoing situation. The town of Hamlin says the Grannies have known since last fall they need a permit to turn this barn into a home. They never mentioned subdivision plans. All they said was floor plan and a sewer plan, which we gave them. Then when they came over with a notice to stop work, that's when they told us we need subdivision plans. In a telephone interview this afternoon, town attorney Richard Olson told News 8 the family knew about the plans last fall and just two weeks ago agreed to have them ready today. A sewer plan is ready, but the remaining documents will take two to three weeks to complete. Stephen Grandy accuses the town of neglecting to tell him everything he needed to get the permit and wonders if it might be a cover-up. The Grandys say they have a lot of unanswered questions about the property, why trash and old appliances are buried under this hill next to the barn, and who did it. People down the street remember this, what we're standing on was flat, was level with the railroad tracks, and as we can see, it's six, seven feet above the railroad tracks. And as far as I understand, it's garbage. I don't know what's underneath there, no. When uh, Mr. Warner, the previous owner, owned it, he asked for some dirt, and I know some of our truck drivers have taken dirt down there at various times and dumped down there for him, but I've got no idea. The Grandys also question the origin of several barrels found on their property, hundreds more on an adjacent lot. Three uncovered wells and trash were also found further down the street. Attorney Olson says he's not aware of them, but will have the town investigate immediately. Olson insists Hamlin is not trying to push the Grandy family out and will give them full consideration at tonight's hearing. Diana Whiteman, News 8. We know more tonight about the victims of the terrorist bombing of that TWA airliner last week over Greece. Autopsies show that two American women and a baby, three of the four American victims, died in the fall from the plane and not from the explosion itself. Pathologists say only the man who was sitting directly over the bomb was killed by that blast. The U.S. ambassador to West Germany says the president is studying a military move against Libya right now in response to a terrorist attack at a West Berlin nightclub. Richard Burt says there are very clear indications Libya may have been involved in the bombing of the disco frequented by American servicemen. One American was killed in that blast. Two people are believed dead, 22 injured tonight from a 45-minute raid by Israel against Palestinian guerrillas near Beirut. Israeli jets streaked in today from the sea through machine gun and missile fire, dropping flares behind them to deflect heat-seeking missiles. 
Witnesses say 10 U.S. supply jets took part in the raid. Six suspected Palestinian bases were hit. It was the largest air raid in months. Talks aimed at reaching a plan for peace in Central America collapsed today, and the blame is being placed on stubborn Nicaragua, at least in some quarters. Its foreign minister says he refused to sign the treaty because it differed from an earlier ratified agreement that had more strongly opposed USA to the Contra rebels. Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger is the first United States cabinet member to meet with Philippine President Cory Aquino. During their 45-minute meeting, he expressed great admiration for the revolution that overthrew Ferdinand Marcos, saying it returned freedom to the Philippines. The meeting took place amid controversy over a perceived American emphasis on military aid rather than economic aid. Philippine demonstrators demanded economic assistance and denounced U.S. military aid to combat a communist insurgency. Still ahead on our late report tonight, cornering the market on potatoes and wine, a drink that kills. We'll be back in just a minute. For the moment, no Italian wine, none, may be imported into the United States because of some of the wine has been poisoned. Some Italian distillers have been using wood alcohol instead of taking the time to allow for natural fermentation. Nine people have died, 60 have been hospitalized in Italy, and the death toll is expected to climb. Some producers are using 20 times the legal limit of wood alcohol in their wine. Wine producers say it'll take years for the industry in Italy to recover from this. What do corn farmers have to do with potato chips? Well, if an experiment by the Frito-Lay company works out, Idaho potatoes may not have a monopoly in the chip game. Mike Day explains. Call it the great potato chip experiment. The Frito-Lay company is experimenting with new places to grow its potatoes. The Robert Jardone farm near Randolph is one of 12 test sites in southern Iowa and northern Missouri. These potatoes are being sliced and covered with fungicide in preparation for planting. Only five acres are being planted here. Frito-Lay has guaranteed farmers $5.50 for every 100 pounds they produce. But money is not the main reason Bob Jardone is joining the project. Just break the monotony, I guess. <laughs> Always kind of like to uh, experiment a little bit. Frito-Lay needs a constant supply of fresh potatoes. The problem is, during the summer, it gets too hot to harvest them in many areas of the south. The potatoes can literally melt in the ground. And that's why they're planting potatoes now here in Iowa. Researchers at Northwest Missouri State University and the Frito-Lay Company are hoping to find a Midwest source of potato chips. When the deep south is done uh, 